Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Jacob Levy. I am the coordinator of the Research Group on Constitutional Studies and the director of the Jan P. Lin Center for the Study of Freedom and Global Orders in the Ancient and Modern Worlds, of which RGCS is a part. The Research Group on Constitutional Studies lecture series has, for nearly 10 years now, aimed to bring leading scholars and researchers who were also skilled and capable teachers to McGill, and this year to McGill virtually, uh, to present ideas from their research about the values, institutions, and principles of free societies in a way that treats the ideas seriously and as accomplishments of their research while still being broadly accessible to student audiences, including advanced undergraduate student audiences. My camera is misbehaving today. I'm not sure why that is. I will keep talking, however. Um, the, uh, the Research Group on Constitutional Studies brings together scholars from across McGill in political science and political theory, uh, political and legal philosophy, constitutional law and public law uh, for work on the institutions and principles and the, uh, the interaction of ideas and, and institutions uh, about the fundamental principles of governance of constitutional societies. Uh, the Lynn Center more broadly is McGill's home for humanistic social inquiry, bridging normative, historical, geographic and spatial modes of analysis in comparative work across eras and across regions in order to understand the roles that ideas, intellectual history, historical transformations, and physical built environments have in shaping and reshaping human social orders. The RGCS lecture series is supported not only by uh, the Jan P. Lin Center, but also by generous grants from our friends at the Institute for Liberal Studies and at the John Dobson Foundation. Today, it is a real delight and honor to bring to the Research Group on Constitutional Studies lecture series, Anthony Appia. Anthony Appia is a world-renowned philosopher working in ethical and moral philosophy, political philosophy, theories of identity, uh, semantics and language, and in public life as a commentator on the moral choices that persons face. Renowned for his combination of analytical rigor, of uh, a, a literary and accessible writing style, and a deeply humane cosmopolitan sensibility. Appiah is the author of some 20 books in philosophy, as well as three novels, uh, has been uh, honored on three continents with uh, it, including through election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Royal Society of Literature, and selected by the Carnegie Corporation of New York as one of America's great immigrants. Um, widely admired as well for his uh, unfailingly good judgment and willingness to serve. Um, he, is, he has served as a juror and selector for prizes ranging from the Pulitzer Prize to the Man Booker Literary Prize to the Berggruen Philosophy Prize for which he was uh, the chair of the jury that awarded the first to our very own Charles Taylor. He has served on the boards of public facing organizations, including the New York Public Library, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Smithsonian Institution's Museum for African Art. Uh, his books include uh, Color Conscious, The Political Morality of Race, The Ethics of Identity, which on a personal note, I will observe was the first book I was ever asked to blurb. Uh, and uh, most prominently, most recently, The Lies That Bind, Rethinking Identity, and The Honor Code, uh, one of which a student who is in attendance today uh, will be given in a random drawing toward the end of the session. Uh, Anthony Appia is professor of philosophy and professor of law at New York University, having previously been a Lawrence S. Rockefeller Professor of Philosophy and in the University Center for Human Values 
at Princeton University, where he now holds those titles in emeritus status. Uh, Professor Appiah is a contributor across disciplines and a contributor to making ideas accessible in ways that uh, exemplify what it is we've tried to do in bringing scholars to RGCS over the years and in ways that uh, led to his being appointed relatively recently as the ethicist columnist for the New York Times Magazine, where he brings good moral judgment and that humane sensibility and literary writing style to a, an even larger audience than he has before. Please join me in welcoming today, Anthony Appiah, whose lecture will be, What About the Workers? Um, thanks, Jacob, very much uh, for that very generous introduction. Um, I'd, be, um, I'd be very honored to meet the person that that was about. Um, <laughs> All right, so let me begin by thanking you for this kind invitation and hoping that what I would have to say today has connections with the issues about uh, constitutionalism in particular. I'm not gonna talk about that directly, but I hope you'll see that uh, some of the issues that I wanna talk about certainly have to do with uh, issues that face the governance in, um, in modern constitutional societies. Uh, I want also to begin by recording a debt. Um, I spent, uh, much of my, well, many hours a week in 2018 and 19, thinking about these issues with a small group of colleagues at three postdoctoral fellows at NYU's Global Institute for Advanced Study, uh, funded by the McGruin Foundation. And they were a philosopher, uh, Denise Celentano, uh, who's uh, from, uh, has a degree uh, from Paris, sociologist, David Brain, who's uh, worked in Wales, and an economist, Ricardo Zago, who's Italian, but now works um, in France. And everything I say today uh, has been uh, informed by their work in these conversations, and occasionally I'll mention, mention particular things that they said to me. Or, uh, but here we go. So most uh, healthy adults today spend five days of the week for much of their lives doing what we call a job. The US Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, declares that all workers are classified uh, into one of 867 detailed occupations according to their occupational definition. I find myself, like some of you, at uh, 251126, philosophy and religion teachers, comma, post-secondary. Because people typically spend eight hours or more of each weekday at work and another eight or so hours sleeping, it's where they spend about a third of their waking hours. Uh, at work is ambiguous between, because we, as we are especially uh, aware at the moment in the current pandemic, because between working and in the workplace. But even in normal times, many of us are sometimes at work at home as well. <laughs> work is also the center of a great number of our relationships. And if we're lucky, our job is not just a source of a decent income. Uh, we will think that what we are doing is worthwhile. Uh, we can also hope to be esteemed for our work, if we do it well, for achievements at work, and we can take pride in what we do, and it may be a source, therefore, of self-esteem as well. Finally, it can be a source of identity or identities too. Perhaps it gives you a profession, conferring on you the status of an auto mechanic, a beautician, a journalist, a nurse, a lawyer, a teacher. Often, along with education and connections in many societies, it helps also to fix your social class, which is another important dimension of identity. Having started working in our late teens or early 20s, we are likely to continue working for another half century or more. And in retirement, when we're no longer doing paid work or at any rate doing much less of it, we may suffer the loss of the sense of purpose that an occupation once gave us and feel nostalgia for the daily rhythms of our job. Given this centrality of work in our lives, it's odd, I think, how little space it takes up in contemporary ethics and in liberal political philosophy. This silence about work echoes our long silence about the family, which feminist philosophy has remediated. It will be important to keep track of gender and family in thinking about work as well. We do, of course, regularly discuss some of the proceeds of work in ethics and political philosophy. We discuss income and wealth. And more recently, we've spent a lot of time thinking about esteem or respect. Uh, and and uh, uh, those things are obviously, as, I, as you'll see from this list, those are things essential to, to the 
role of uh, work in our lives. And so we think about the allocation of uh, esteem and respect when we discuss uh, distributive justice and equality. And we recognize in ethics and moral philosophy generally that the character of our relationship matters. And this thought has come to be central to more recent thinking about political equality too. But the focus of our interest is more likely to be on relations with our fellow citizens generally and what it means to treat one another in the political sphere as equals, for example, than on how we interact with others in the workplace in particular. Indeed, we take it for granted that at work, we are not equals. Most work is organized hierarchically. There are managers, bosses, deans, presidents. We have spent a great deal of time in political philosophy reflecting on how the state and its agents can derive the authority to command the citizen only recently, I think it's fair to say, have philosophers begun to take with full seriousness questions about democracy in the world workplace, at least in the tradition, traditions that I've been raised in. Now, there are exceptions, important exceptions, to the relative silence about work as a philosophical problem. Uh, Elizabeth Anderson's book, A Private Government, How Employers Rule Our Lives and Why We Don't Talk About It, is an eminent, exemplary, and excellent e recent example here. Axel Harnath has connected work with important issues of recognition in the struggle for recognition, the moral grammar of social conflicts and some of his writing since. And he's following, of course, in the footsteps of Marx and the Marxists who thought a great deal about work and its role in our lives and identities in ways shaped by their debt to Hegel. In the 1950s, Hannah Arendt writing in uh, The Human Condition distinguished labor making or acquiring food and shelter and all the other natural things we do in order to sustain our biological life from work, uh, the artificial shaping of the world to make products. And she had a final category action, which had to do with what we do with uh, one another. And her book, which first appeared in 1958, already addresses the significance of automation, uh, which is reflected in the, uh, in the picture I've chosen as my backdrop, uh, which shows you, uh, uh, as it were, humans uh, giving life to uh, uh, automata in the way that uh, God uh, gave life to Adam, at least in the representation of it in the Sistine Chapel. Um, as um, Hannah Arendt wrote, uh, a society of laborers is about to be liberated from the fetters of labor and this society does no longer know those other higher and more meaningful activities for the sake of which this freedom would deserve to be won. Arendt was echoing an argument that the economist John Maynard Keynes had made in 1930 in a once famous essay on the economic possibilities of our, for our grandchildren. To those who sweat for their daily bread, he wrote, leisure is a longed for sweet until they get it. There is the traditional epitaph written for herself by the old charwoman. Don't mourn for me, friends, don't weep for me never, for I'm going to do nothing forever and ever. This was her heaven. Thus, Keynes went on, for the first time since his creation, man will be faced with his real, his permanent problem, how to use his freedom from pressing economic cares, how to occupy the leisure which science and compound interest will have won for him, to live wisely and agreeably and well. But the general consensus since then has essentially been that Arendt and Keynes uh, we're worrying about something you didn't need to worry about. Our conception of what is valuable in human life has been so profoundly formed by the place of work for people today that we suppose we will find new ways of making work, even if the biological needs that Arendt's labor was meant to meet can all be met by intelligent machines. But Keynes had anticipated that problem. For many ages to come, he said, the old Adam will be so strong in us that everybody will need to be to do some work if he's to be contented. Um, that he in there should remind you that a lot of what the women of Keynes's day were doing didn't count as work in uh, Keynes's uh, thinking. Uh, for the heirs to a Protestant ethic, how heaven or heaven on earth would continue to be busy. Uh, George Bernard Shaw made the same claim more succinctly with reference not to hell, not to heaven, but to the other place. A perpetual holiday, he said, is a good working definition of hell. Um, and he also said this other thing. Now the jobs created by the Industrial Revolution did at least four important things. First, they 
of course, produced goods in larger quantities and with increasing efficiency. And, um, and uh, the service economy is growing too. A second thing they did was to provide employees and shareholders with income. They built on the genius of capitalism for taking one person's savings and combining it with the industry of others and the ideas of even more to produce an income for all three. A third thing, an important consequence of the Industrial Revolution was the creation of new forms of community and identity. Trains unions come with union picnics and factories may have sports teams and Christmas parties. In the work itself too, at least in the best of jobs, one's product is the result of rewarding social processes, the combined effort effect of the coordinated interactions of human beings collaborating, working together. And the final fourth thing, uh, important contribution of the new forms of labor was that if you were lucky, your work, as I said, was a source of significance. The, the working men's associations of 19th century Britain were reflections of a growing pride in manual labor. People came to appreciate that the goods they were making helped uh, or helping to make were important to their country and its people and were often valued by others at home and abroad around the world. Writing about the 19th century trades unions, E.P. Thompson says in his classic book on the, makings, the making of the English working class, uh, social and moral criteria, subsistence, self-respect, pride in certain standards of workmanship, customary rewards for different grades of skill are as prominent in early trade union disputes as strictly economic arguments, that is arguments about money and hours. William Blake may have seen in the factories of the Industrial Revolution only dark satanic mills. Their denizens increasingly saw the work they did as a source of pride, identity, and meaning. And the associations, unions, and clubs they formed in which people who worked together, played together, came to perform a role not just in their political lives, but in their social lives as well. The Industrial Revolution begins in Britain in the mid 18th century. Over the next two centuries, working men and women increasingly needed more formal education to do their new work. Following written instructions and keeping proper records presupposed literacy. And in the factories themselves, people were trained to use more and more complex machines. As unions and their allies in legislatures pushed back the length of the working day and defended the weekend, and as wages increased, workers came to have the sort of free time that had once been the privilege of their social superiors. Leisure was no longer a middle-class distinction, let alone a mark of the aristocracy. Over time, working people too came to seek the advantages of education for its own sake, not just because it increased their value as labor. By the time the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was formulated, just after the Second World War, Article 23, guaranteed the right to work, to free employment, to just and favorable conditions of work and to protection against unemployment. But Article 24 immediately added, everyone has the right to rest and leisure, including reasonable limitation of working hours and periodic holidays with pay. The working class was following here a path set earlier by the middle classes. Through the course of the 19th century, uh, romanticism encouraged an ideal of self-development, which we see in Matthew Arnold's condemnation of Philistinism uh, in, um, uh, in Culture and Anarchy in 1869, and in John Stuart Mill's celebration in chapter three of On Liberty of individuality as one of the elements of well-being. Playing and listening to music, reading literature, writing and reciting poetry, painting, and looking at paintings, sculpting, visiting art museums, learning history and social science, even following the sciences of their day, all came to be part of what it was expected of an educated middle-class man or woman. And this is part of what Mill meant when he talked about human development, as he often did. Now, the Germans call this a form of self-cultivation, Bildung, and European societies had a growing class they later called the Bildungsburgertum, the educated bourgeoisie, we say in English. And one of the central questions that received the attention of German philosophers beginning in the uh, early 19th century, but uh, peaking in the late 19th century, early 20th century, was what they called the uh, die soziale Frage, the social question. And at its heart was the welfare of the new working class created by industrialization, urbanization, and an expanding population. Eventually, Bildung came to be part of this story for Bildung was now a component of a normal human life. 
It was not just for alleged aristocracy or for the free time of a prosperous middle class. And so, starting at the turn of the 19th century in many places in Europe and North America, new institutions were created to extend the benefits of Bildung to workers. Beginning in the 1880s, the settlement house movement in Britain and the United States moved middle-class so-called settlers in alongside working class families in part so that the former could share their culture with the latter. In 1899, Ruskin College was founded in Oxford to offer a college education to working men who did not have access to Oxford University. This democratization of learning became one of the founding aims of the British Broadcasting Corporation in 1922 under the leadership of Lord Reith, John Reith. Uh, less than a century later, Reith's ideals were reflected in the founding here in the United States of the American Corporation for Public Broadcasting, whose stated purpose is to provide programs and services that inform, educate, enlighten, and enrich the public and help inform civil discourse essential to American society. One of the basic social and economic challenges of our time, I think, is to find ways of involving people in meaningful activity and at the same time both distribute the social product fairly, giving everyone a satisfactory income and also produce the goods and services we need. We need new ways, that is, of achieving the four important things that I said that good jobs did in industrial society. This is an intellectual and imaginative challenge as much as an institutional one. I'm going to call it, with apologies to my friends in the philosophy of mind, the hard problem. It's the hard problem of uh, uh, social theory and uh, political philosophy, I think, uh, uh, how to rethink work. That we can only solve it properly today if we do so in ways that are ecologically sustainable only adds to its difficulty. This hard problem then is to work out how to produce the goods and services we need while providing people with income sociability and significance. And the major issue is whether we do this by changing the ways we construct and provide jobs, which is the root of reimagining work, or by meeting these needs for many or most people without their having jobs, as a self-styled post-work movement is suggesting. And the thought there is not just that work might disappear for many, but that the concept of work is an obstacle to progress. In deciding if it is, Getting clear about that concept is surely the right first step. Technological change means that fewer and fewer people are needed to produce the same quantity of goods and services. The result is that there are many people whose only income comes from the state and private philanthropy or from jobs that lack the satisfaction in income, meaning and sociability that once secured the status of the uh, more fortunate members of the industrial working class. If they have left the labor pool altogether, and are no longer seeking employment, it's not just because there are literally no jobs. Rather, they've given up on finding a job for which they are qualified and that can be a source of self-respect, or if not, of an income large enough to make up for the fact that the work is not a source of self-respect. Leaving the labor pool, of course, means that they no longer participate in the community of the workplace. But many of the new jobs don't have much place for sociability either wish uh, with people now able to telecommute, and we're surely all extremely conscious of this at the moment. Uh, um, I haven't uh, been in the physical presence of my colleagues at work uh, for, more, for a year now, uh, nor have I had a, a discussion in person with a student. Uh, of course, we're constantly in touch with each other on Zoom, but that's another, that's a different thing. And it's a different kind of sociability. And, and with people now able to telecommute, we'll see whether after this forced isolation, uh, more workers are asked to continue to do more of their work at home, uh, which thus saving their employers uh, uh, the cost of renting or buying office space uh, and so on. And, and also for workers reducing the time spent commuting. So even after all this, those who do have employment uh, may not gain the experience of community from their work that they did beforehand. And if you work as an Uber or a Lyft driver or in many other occupations in the gig economy, your assignments are organized without ever bringing you together with others who are doing the same job for the same company. Uber drivers are not a community of fellow workers. Worse, many modern people are doing what the uh, anthropologist David Graeber, who sadly died recently, has dubbed a uh, 
if my mother was here, I'd have to say, mum, this is in quotes, a quote, bullshit job, uh, defined as uh, one so completely pointless, unnecessary, uh, defined by Graeber, as one so completely pointless, unnecessary, or pernicious that even the employee cannot justify its existence. Uh, now, uh, Graeber, who's an amusing writer, cites the result of a British YouGov poll that said, that asked people, does your job make a meaningful contribution to the world? Astonishingly, he wrote, more than a third, 37% of British workers, said they believed that their work did not make a meaningful contribution to the world. 50% said it did, and 13%, perhaps these are the saddest people, were uncertain whether they were making a contribution to the world. At least the 37% knew what their situation was. Now, Graeber claims that people often conflate bullshit jobs with something else, and here again, apologies to my late mother, what he uh, follows modern usage in calling shit jobs. The issues here are indeed worth distinguishing, as he pointed out, since bullshit jobs and shit jobs are by no means the same thing. Um, this is the Urban Dictionary's definition of a, of a shit job, uh, unfulfilling, tedious waste of eight, eight, eight plus hours of the, of the day, five days of the week that you only persist with in order to pay the bills and the ever mounting debt that comes from having to increase your spending in order to entertain yourself outside of working hours as you are so brain dead from the hours you spend in work. Okay, uh, that's a, a, of course a tendentious definition, but you get the idea. And uh, Graeber points out that, that uh, shit jobs and bullshit jobs are by no means the same thing because Bad jobs are bad because they're hard or they have terrible conditions or the pay sucks. But often those jobs are extremely useful. They're by no means uh, uh, bullshit jobs. Many of the important, many of the, as again, we've seen during the pandemic, uh, many, many of the bad jobs are absolutely essential. They're not, um, they may not bring much significance to the people who do them, but they're very easy for them to defend uh, the importance of. So both kinds of jobs raise ethical problems, of course. Even if you recognize your job is useful, there's no guarantee that it will contribute to your satisfaction if the pay or working conditions are awful. Increasingly then, one source of meaning in human lives, the job, the career, and its sociability and its achievements is going away. And though this problem has developed first in the industrialized democracies, it will eventually surely spread everywhere. It's certainly good, I mean, unless we do something to stop it. It's certainly good that machines can be turned to doing and making useful things that it's no fun for people to make or to do. Where possible, what Graeber calls shit jobs need to be eliminated. It may also be good when the efficiency of production grows in the sense that it takes fewer and fewer people to make things. Though we should give a moment's thought to the possibility that there are automatable tasks that human beings might enjoy doing and receiving the results of, and that therefore, we might not want to automate. But our automated economy still makes the things that were at the core of production in the old economy. Indeed, we're making more and better things. That though can leave income, sociability and significance unattended to. You could solve the problem of the disappearance of the wage by establishing a basic income guaranteed to all citizens. But that too wouldn't help you with the loss of community and the loss of meaning. Conversely, in a society like ours, where no one can provide for their basic needs without money or expensive land, a life of sociability and meaning without access to an income is no longer possible. There are three recognizably philosophical tasks here, I think. The first, which I've been pursuing uh, since the start, is just to explore the concept of work, to think about what work is and what our conceptions of it uh, uh, are. That project, though, in a sense, I suppose, a matter of conceptual analysis, is not, uh, is not certainly a priori. For work develops along with technologies and institutions. So the inquiry is in part historical because work and the concept of work develop together. Ian Hacking remarked in the second chapter of Historical Ontology, that uh, Foucault's books are mostly about practices and how they affect and are affected by the talk in which we embed them. The upshot is less a fascination with words than with people and institutions, with what we do for people and to people. I remember as an undergraduate hearing Hacking introduce Foucault's methods 
at the Moral Sciences Club at Cambridge in the 70s. It, it took me a while to know what to do with those ideas, but I find this basic thought is now an essential philosophical tool. Once we've understood what work is, a question in social ontology, there is next, of course, an ethical inquiry. How does work fit into making a good life? Uh, how does it advance uh, eudaimonia? How does it help humans flourish? Here too, the inquiry strikes me as necessarily historical. Uh, but it also requires us to draw on our own social experience and on reports in history, sociology, anthropology, and imaginative literature of the experiences of others. I don't mean that the conceptual inquiry is sharply bounded from the ethical inquiry. Our understanding of the meaning and the value of work develops historically with the economy, with the institutions and technologies we engage in our work. And the conceptual inquiry is already a normative one, as we have seen, because you cannot understand what a job is without understanding the idea of a good job. The third set of issues is sociopolitical. How should work be constrained or constructed by law and other social norms? And how should opportunities and rewards for work be distributed? We have models for thinking about these issues, of course. One is the Rawlsian program, if we ask, in which we ask how we would respond to these questions if we didn't know what opportunities we ourselves would have. But the question only arises for Rawls because society and the state are immense and valuable cooperative enterprises whose benefits and burdens must be fairly shared. It's justice as fairness. The basic structure of society, the family, the law, the economy, what Rawls called the main political and social institutions and the way they fit together as one scheme of cooperation, as he put it, must be, as he also put it, a fair system of social cooperation over time from one generation to the next. Now, Rawls's program is offered as a contribution to ideal theory. It's worked out for an ordered society whose members and whose institutions are known by all to meet two conditions. They have a shared commitment to an ideal of justice and their institutions more or less realize it. I think much can be learned by asking the questions in Rawls's way, but there is also a great deal to be learned from an approach that I associate with that most philosophical of economists, Amartya Sen. We don't begin with a picture of a just society, not because that picture idealizes too much, which is one objection people make to Rawls, but because it misunderstands the epistemology of our moral knowledge about politics. The general point, which Sen has rightly made central to his recent thinking, is that you can judge social option A better than social option B without starting with a view of the best society and asking whether having A or having B brings you closer to it. Just as you can tell that a Rembrandt is better than a Riesdale uh, without any idea of what the best painting would look like. I think this point, though simple, is a deep and important one. You don't need to know what the heavens are like to know which way is up. This insight fits with another. Our collective moral learning doesn't require the development of a picture of an ideal society. It starts most often with the rejection of some current actual practice or structure, which we come to see as wrong. You learn to be in favor of equality by noticing what is wrong with the unequal treatment of women or black people or working class or lower caste or LGBTQ people. You learn to be in favor of freedom by seeing what is wrong in the life of serfs or the enslaved or of women in Perda. So rather than involve invoking ideal societies, I'd rather ask whether we can move our actual norms, our laws and our institutions towards the provision for everyone of the resources for a more dignified human life. This is a question that arises naturally within a society that's up and running. And the critique of current institutions and practices develops because we discover through what Mill called experiments of living that features of our current life damage or enhance the possibilities for human flourishing. We start, for example, with gender norms as they are and discover that they're disabling for trans people and so need revision. No need to think abstractly about the biological significance of sexual difference and imagine without presuppositions, painting as it were on an empty canvas, what would be the best way of developing a set of ideas and practices around gender. Let's just try to make the ones we have better. Because what makes a life a, a, a life of dignity can depend on local cultural understandings. The idea of a dignified life is not external 
to social arrangements. It's not that is something we bring to our question, how should we make the world to enable a dignified life for everyone from the outside? We can only ask these questions about equality and dignity from within a society and its social understandings. Even when we ask them about another society, as we might, we do so by bringing our understandings of equality and dignity and seeing whether, and if so, how they are expressed elsewhere. And both what is dignified and how to relate as equals are matters of ongoing ethical evolution. In that historical development, there's a kind of dialectical relationship between institutional and technological change on the one hand and normative understandings on the other, of the sort that is evident in the changing conceptions of what it is for work to be rewarding and how work fits into the project of making a life. Now, the Luddites were convinced that the mechanization of existing forms of labor would destroy jobs. And so it did, of course. But it also created them. Uh, Ricardo Zago taught me about the economic mechanism here in a variety of cases. Uh, take first the mechanization of agriculture, which certainly has reduced the number of agricultural workers. So it took jobs out of agriculture. It also lowered food prices, and so it increased demand. Uh, as a result, creating new jobs in the transportation and distribution and preparation of foods. As Zago pointed out to me, it's not a coincidence, he wrote this in a, in a note to me, it's not a coincidence that the meatpacking districts of New York and its other cities hugely developed in the same periods in which the mechanization of agriculture occurred. Similarly, the more recent spread of ATMs displaced bank tellers, but increased the profits of banks, allowing them to open more branches, as you will have noticed, where they had more workers to do managerial tasks and customer care, jobs where people still have a comparative advantage over machines. One current problem in the United States, at least, is not so much a consequence of a net loss of jobs. It's a consequence of the human cost associated with the transition from one regime of jobs to another. The sorts of adjustments that occurred in the mechanization of agriculture and the spread of the ATM take time. The literature and labor economics suggests that the recent round of job displacements as a result of automation and of the transfer of jobs to lower cost labor markets elsewhere has been accompanied by very slow improvements in employment. And by improvements, I mean the replacement of lost jobs with ones that are better or at least as good. New jobs in an automating economy are usually going to require new skills. Finding or training workers with these skills can take time. A displaced worker's initial value in the new labor market may be lower than her value in the old one. It may take her time or money to acquire the necessary human capital. One source of the growth of high school education in the early 20th century in the United States was the government's recognition that the children of the workers displaced from pre-mechanical agriculture needed preparation for new forms of employment. And finally, the new jobs may be in new places and someone has to bear these costs of internal migration. Uh, or sometimes, uh, of course, transnational migration if the jobs are in another country. These traditional difficulties seem to be accentuated in the current economy by four things. First, progress in information technology and robotics has contributed to increasing polarization in the labor market. IT displaces many middle-class jobs, like those in the car industry, that require moderate levels of training and skill, and the new jobs are either high-skill, high-wage, or low-skill, low-wage jobs, contributing to the hollowing out of the middle class, that is something that we talk about a lot, these days, uh, rightly, because it's important. But second, in the United States anyway, the share of GDP going to workers appears to have been steadily declining. I'm aware that there are disputes about the facts here, so I'm just announcing a view, not defending it, uh, but that is my view, and it's the view of the labor economists that I uh, talk to that I agree, seem plausible. Third, the increasing uh, Concentration of so-called superstar firms in certain sectors means that they can erect barriers to entry that reduce competition in ways that limit the bargaining power, both of workers and of customers. Uh, try uh, negotiating as a worker or as a customer with Amazon or Google. Good luck with that. And fourth, one factor in the creation of the modern precariat uh, is uh, the fact that uh, the, it, 
um, that people within North America and even in smaller geographies such as England's are less likely than you might have expected to go where the jobs are. And one cause here is the increasing disparity between the costs of living in rural areas and small towns uh, and the value of the particular of the housing assets that people have in small towns as compared to the, what their housing will cost in the city uh, or the suburbs. And uh, on the one hand, and the most productive metropolises on the other, just as another is not material, but cultural, it's the polarization of values between the small town and the cosmopolitan city. Uh, so we now face a set of normative questions about whose job it is to meet these challenges, the state, corporations, schools and universities, and private philanthropy are all actually playing a role. But what's the proper division of responsibilities? Some policies that have been considered to meet these difficulties aim in effect to strengthen the position of workers in one of four ways. Uh, first, by increasing their skills through education and training. Second, by assisting them in identifying new opportunities. Third, through a commitment by the government to be an employer of last resort, guaranteeing every person a meaningful job consistent with their developed capacities. This is not something that's happening in the United States, but it's a proposal in some places. And fourth, by guaranteeing a basic income which allows people to refuse jobs that are not sufficiently rewarding in income, esteem, sociability, or significance, because they have the resources, the material resources for an okay life without a job. So the first three of these possibilities treat the problem as a matter of reforming the nature of work. And here business and the educational system and the state, it seems to me all have a role to play. But the last, entertains the possibility sketched by Keynes of sharing the social product in ways that move beyond the idea of work as the temporal and eudaimonic center of our lives. And that's the post-work option. And one possible such option is to begin by guaranteeing everyone a sufficiently high basic income. It requires evidently a political decision, can't be done by business or the universities on their own. And it requires, in order to get to that political decision, normative reflection. I mean, to decide whether to do it or not. Um, Denise Salantalo taught me to see that there may be normative reasons, however, for wondering whether people might not have a duty to work if they can. This is not just a matter of um, uh, adhering to the secularized version of the Protestant ethic that pervades many uh, societies. Uh, the most natural understanding of the feature of work that's relevant here, at least if it's not a bullshit job, is that it entails spending time doing something that makes, in some sense, a social contribution. Once we think, as uh, Rawls taught me to do, of the basic structure as a scheme of cooperation, whose obligations and rewards need to be fairly distributed, then someone who's not making a contribution to the scheme is no more entitled to its privileges than someone in a society elsewhere. It doesn't follow, of course, that we owe her nothing any more than the fact that someone lives in another country means that we could ignore her in our moral thinking. But there seems to be a basis here for the thought that it is only through work that we are connected to others in society in the ways that raise the question of distributive fairness in the national context at all. I think there are immediate reasons for resisting this argument for a duty to engage in paid work though. For one thing, uh, the basic structure includes more than the economy. The family is a site where many of the things we do, especially in the domain of child rearing, have not, at least in the part, counted as work. And nevertheless, they are an important form of social contribution. And so is our political life as participants in public reasoning, as voters and through our respect for the laws. Here too, we contribute in ways for which we have not historically been rewarded through income, though in politics, as in family, we can earn esteem for our contributions. It's actually quite hard to imagine a modern person whose life is totally without contributions in one or another of these domains away from work. But even if someone succeeded in escaping from contributing, there would be other reasons for wondering whether a duty to work imposes a condition of any social provision would be consistent with other things that matter. It seems evident, for example, that all of us have obligations to others, most obviously negative duties to avoid unnecessary harm, that don't depend on the fact of our being connected in a scheme of cooperation. Furthermore, uh, by making shared contributions together to some project. Furthermore, at least some ways of making social provision 
depending on, uh, sorry, some ways of making social tradition depend on contributions can violate notions of autonomy. Uh, Beata Ressler has written, uh, subjects have to work whether they want to or not, uh, people who don't have any money anyway, with regard to the very question of why people work, their autonomy doesn't seem to play a role. So what she's doing is asking us to consider whether imposing work as a condition of providing someone with the means for a dignified existence uh, might violate their autonomy. Now, I think, uh, influenced by Joseph Raz, that autonomy requires only an adequate range, I'm quoting Raz here, of valuable options and independence from coercion and manipulation. So why should having to do some kind of work or other, picked, suppose, the, let us suppose, from a wide range of meaningful occupations for which you are prepared uh, by the social processes of education, uh, why should doing that mean you don't have adequate options and freedom from manipulation and coercion? To say that someone who's forced in this way to work is coerced or exploited seems to me to beg the question, because to be to coerced is to be forced in morally impermissible ways to do something, and to be exploited is to have someone wrongfully take advantage of your vulnerability. A person who has the option of many decent jobs, even if she'd rather do nothing, is not vulnerable to any particular employer, nor given a range of reasonable choices, is it evidently wrong to expect her to take up one or other of them. And so, to put it simply, it seems to me that to have an adequate range of choices, it's not obvious that you have to have the option of relying on the labor of others for your basic needs. Uh, there are reasons too for uh, the labor or the capital of others. There are reasons too for wondering about the social and psychological challenges of a world in which many fewer people are gaining their income from work. The sociological literature on employment raises many doubts about the possibility of a satisfying life without it for most people. But on the other hand, evidence drawn from the experience of unemployment or of retirement in our current social system seems a bad place to start. Because as Daniel Sage has argued recently, unemployed people live in societies where paid work yields status, identity, respect, and, and a sense of human worth. The damage of unemployment, he argues, is thus not the absence of paid work, but the failure to conform to a powerful social norm. In a culture where, as the political scientist James Chamberlain argues, hard work is seen as an expression of virtue and good character, symbolizes independence and is a main way to fulfill civic duty and make a social contribution, it's not surprising if worklessness produces depression or anxiety. But we need to entertain the possibility that those responses are the result of a philosophical error, not a constraint on possible new forms of social life with new social norms. Maybe the reason we think that way is because we're too addicted to the idea of work and if we reshape society in ways that make the idea of work unnecessary, and, uh, we may be able to escape that sense of um, uh, anxiety or depression produced in many people in, in the actual state of things by, um, by uh, retirement or unemployment. The issues I've been discussing will mostly arise even if a post-work society is just a less work society in which we do paid work for many fewer hours, or if we settle on providing a universal basic income and many people engage in no paid work at all, or if we share rewarding labor or the unpleasant socially necessary tasks that cannot be automated, uh, or both, even if we share those in some other way uh, than through the labor market. Work will need to be refigured if we take seriously the idea of lives in which income is no longer wholly dependent on a job. At the heart of these reflections is the recognition that just as the industrial revolution produced new conceptions of value, like the equation of time with money that uh, Weber talks about in Franklin at the beginning of the Protestant ethic, uh, just as the industrial revolution produces new conceptions of value, so in our modern economy, changing institutions will have to be accompanied by conceptual and institutional innovations that it will take imagination to shape and to share. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, at the RGCS lectures, the first question is reserved for a member of the research group on constitutional studies student fellowship. Uh, so the floor is open to 
one of the student fellows. Sometimes takes a minute for people to process. Um, <laughs> at least. <laughs> All right, I will buy you, uh, buy, buy the students a moment to collect their, th oh no, there we go, Nessie. Hello. Hi, um, how are you? Uh, thank you for a really great talk. Um, um, I was wondering, uh, in the context of a class I'm taking now about indigenous politics, how- uh, About what? About indigenous politics. Indigenous politics, good. Um, how, this conception of post-work futures or this idea about work that you've presented that includes this social identity making functions and esteem functions uh, could learn. What our uh, future projections could learn from ways of thinking that maybe all, did not consider these functions to begin with um, and how we could put that into conversation. I mean, I think that's a very interesting thought. Uh, um, one point of starting with the way in which these issues were configured by the Industrial Revolution is to remind us that this way of doing things is just one way of doing things. And even in the places where it is a way of doing things, it's a, it's a way of doing things that isn't all that old in human terms. There are other ways of doing things uh, in the past, and there are other conceptions associated with those other ways of doing things. And some of those other ways of doing things uh, have uh, have a deep uh, uh, historical roots, but still have a life in the present. Uh, and, and one of the places where that is true, I think, is in some first peoples around the world uh, who are living, for whom the, the notion of a job is, is not one of the things that organizes uh, their lives. Uh, because if you're living up the Amazon, say, uh, uh, you, you do lots of um, sort of uh, work in the in the thermodynamic sense of work, but you don't, you don't. Uh, the connection between hours worked and income is uh, and, and and product is entirely uh, unpredictable. Uh, if you're a hunter or, or, or even if you're a farmer, and um, and so on. So and and then a, a lot of your time, if you're a hunter or a farmer, is is spent uh, waiting, and in those waiting times, you're doing things with other people in your community. Uh, you're you're uh, uh, telling tales or. Uh, um, doing what uh, a sociologist would recognize as building social capital, uh, they're making connections and so on. And, um, you know, th th I think those people would be astonished that to, 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 to imagine a life in which, um, uh, let's say, a, a, a man, a woman, and their, uh, and their uh, late uh, teenage children uh, disappear from one another all day <laughs> to do different things and things that are completely unrelated to one another, both in terms of their productive roles and in terms of their relation to the household, and then come back. And if they're very lucky, are not so tired that they can't uh, sit around and ask each other what they've been doing all day. But that's a really weird way of, uh, you know, that's, a, that's an odd way. Uh, if, you, if you look at sort of human history, um, a lot of times in human history, people have thought that was a very odd way to per se. On the other hand, you know, sometimes in human history, um, men disappeared, Alexander's troops, 30,000 of them, disappeared from Macedon for years, <laughs> leaving families behind. So, uh, you know, different societies do these things in different ways. And I think thinking about how other people have done it is, all, is often the first place to start. And, and drawing on the imaginations, as I say, of our uh, uh, science fiction writers and, and other imaginative, uh, including science fiction writers who make movies, of course, not just, not just novels, um, is, I think, uh, helpful here because otherwise, so, so I, I urged us to think in a kind of meliorist way that uh, Amartya Sen's thinking encourages, but I don't think we should do that uh, in a way that begins with a limited imagination of the possibilities. Uh, that, 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 that's not the point of the meliorism. Um, uh, it, so I think we should be th 
um, exercising our imaginations widely and thinking about this, these questions uh, more, perhaps more ambitiously, at least somebody, maybe just us in the academy, along with these imaginative writers, should be thinking more ambitiously than most of the thinking seems to be going on in the policy arena, uh, more ambitiously. And, and in that thinking, disaggregating the things that jobs do and saying they you don't have to have something that does all those things. All those things have to be done. We have to make stuff, we have to provide services, people have to have incomes, they have to have sociability and significance. Um, for us right now, even in post-industrial society, work does an awful lot of those things and packages them in a particular way. But, you know, uh, at some point, you know, it, it, um, both um, Keynes and, and, uh, and Russell and, uh, and, and later a little bit Arendt, um, you know, these are people, very smart people, uh, who thought that we would have this problem earlier than we have had it. And it's an interesting question why we haven't. And one question, one part of the answer, as I said, is that new technologies make jobs as well as destroying them. But at some point, it just seems, and again, maybe this is a failure of imagination on my part, but at some point, it just seems to me in the AI revolution, you know, uh, there's just going to be ways of getting all the things that we need to have done done with many fewer people than there are getting them done for. <laughs> and then we have to figure out how to share the social product, most of which will be produced by AI and machines, which, which will, on current trajectories, end up being owned by five people. Uh, and that doesn't seem to me a good solution uh, for lots of reasons, uh, but fundamentally for political reasons, because we don't. nobody should have that kind of power over the lives of other people. Nobody should be able to dominate the lives of other people by controlling all the productive resources. So, um, so we really need to, you know, I mean, you know, there are lots of responses to the sort of thing I just said, which I, which I can also imagine. Someone says, well, it's not five people, it's five corporations, and the stock of the corporations is widely shared, and so on. I, I, I'm, not, I'm aware that, there are, that we should go back and forth here. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that this is a, a reason for uh, depression or despair. I'm just saying that, uh, that we should be thinking about the, the options here. Um, and I think we should be thinking about them that ways that, uh, as I said, that uh, are guided by the thought that the, the object of the, of the social enterprise is to make sure that everybody can live a life of dignity. And that includes uh, a significant concern that they should have important kinds of freedom. Um, you can't have, in my view, dignity without all sorts of kinds of freedom. And one of the worries about the way uh, the current technologies are going is that they they don't seem super respectful of freedom. Vertica. Uh, thank you very much for uh, that uh, very thought provoking and inspiring talk. So I was uh, curious about one thing which you said in the beginning of your talk is that the worst workers were the ones who were uncertain who did not know whether their jobs gave them satisfaction or not. And uh, in the story that you have told, that a point like provoked something which I'm interested to know that uh, none of the works which you said that there's, you mentioned that there is this silence on the philosophy of work, which is absolutely bizarre because we sp spend one third of our lives in, in our working lives. So one of the things which, uh, um, I've been thinking about, which I think is a problem these days, is that work itself has become much more uncertain and the possibility of just having work has become uncertain, which uh, I think is one of the primary, let's say, uh, reasons for anxiety in the kind of age of anxiety we live. And uh, often, let's say, many people like, for instance, Jane Manswich in a lecture described that we live in an age of fear increasingly because, uh, and a lack of a secure job seems to be one of them. So, but your uh, overview, let's say, suggests that even though we may, let's say, have a secure income that will not solve the problem. So I was wondering in, in let's say, for if you think, because we should think about these questions in a historical sense, would you say that compared to the 20th century, does the 21st century 
is there any historical evidence to suggest that yes, work has become more insecure and that is a problem which states should particularly solve because like, you know, non-state actors cannot really solve providing a basic income. So right. if Good. you say more on that. Well, I think there is lots of uh, argument and evidence that, uh, uh, well, so just, just again, it's useful to disaggregate things. Um, those people who are insecure about their employment would be much less insecure if they were guaranteed that if this job went away, they would immediately get another one. Uh, they, in other words, the, it's, uh, part of it is insecurity about, uh, as it were, this job, and some of it is insecurity about a job. And um, it's very hard for an employer to solve the second problem, right? Because one of the main reasons why employers fire people is because they can't afford them anymore because they're going out of business. And, uh, and the last person you want to go to to try and uh, provide social provision for someone who's just lost a job is a company that's just about to go bankrupt or cease, or cease operations. That seems like a, a very foolish place to put the, <laughs> to, to put the mechanism for solving that problem. Um, so one, one and but one thing. So um, you know, since the ideal job for a sort of regular middle class American in the mid twentieth century was a was a lifetime enterprise, right? You you, uh, you 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 were you became, and and this was even more striking in some other economies. I mean, in Japan, uh, you know, the contract essentially, not the legal contract, but the, the social contract with the worker was. You join us, you stay with us, you rise uh, slowly through, through the ranks to, to the proper level. You, re you reach your level of incompetence and we'll keep you at that level. Uh, and, or competence, perhaps I should put it more politely. And then, um, and, and, you know, and then at the end of the process, uh, you, you'll have enough uh, in retirement and all of that is going to come from us. So you make this deal with us. Well, that's gone away even in Japan. Uh, the deal was never as good uh, in the United States, uh, but it was, you know, if you were working in one of the successful uh, auto industry, parts of the auto industry, you expected. Uh, and so, and so from the point of view of the worker, right, the initial wage is combined with the expectation of an averaged wage over a long haul, which is rising roughly predictably. And that's the bank. That's what your, that's as it were your, what you're offering your commitments to. And if that just gets cut off, in a way, you've been denied what you were reasonably expecting. So of course, those people became insecure when when people started uh, when, when Ford and people like that and you know started uh, uh, firing people who thought that they had lifetime employment. And um, and as I say. Uh, we can discuss um, uh, whether that process was well handled by, by the managers of those corporations. But at the end of the process, they were not in a position to uh, do the things that would make the transition to a new job easy for the workers they were firing because they didn't have the resources. And also they often had huge pension commitments, which they had not properly capitalized. Um, so, uh, so if you have, you can think of it this way. It's, it's analogous to, to a way I think we might think about what's the point of private property? Well, there are lots of points of private property, but one of them is that it gives you a secure relation to certain things that have significance in your life, like that place you live <laughs> and, and the books you care about and, and the clothing that you like to wear. Uh, you don't have to worry. Private property means that those things are yours for as long as you want them, basically. And that they the only way they get to leave is if you swap them with somebody else for money or something you want more. Uh, or you give them away to someone that you care about, right? It's all under your control. So it, it's, um, it expands your self-regulation, your autonomy, your, your capacity for self-management, private property. It's one of the reasons why uh, a life without private property strikes me as hellish. Um, now, that doesn't mean you need to be able to have a trillion dollars in your bank account. That's a separate question. You don't need a trillion dollars in your bank account to, to secure any of the things I just talked about. But it means that certain kinds of private property are really central to human freedom. Well, that kind of security um, 
is, un is unavailable to people in a society organized around work if they can be fired at any time. And so just as uh, some kind of protection, um, uh, I mean, the United States is peculiar. We have only one state in the United States that doesn't uh, in effect have uh, a system where workers can be fired at will. Employment at will is the legal norm. There's one state, I think it's Utah, surprisingly, uh, that, that, does, uh, that doesn't do that. Now, if, of course, most, lots of modern people have contracts of employment, so they are protected by something from mere, from being fired. I, I can't be fired by NYU just like that. They have to prove that, I viol that I'm, uh, they have to go through a committee, which will have other academics on it and persuade them that I've uh, violated certain important academic norms. Um, and I'm not going to do that, so I'm not worried about being fired. Um, uh, and I trust my colleagues to make that judgment. Uh, I, I don't know so I trust the dean, but I certainly trust the committee of colleagues that would be that would be hard to do it. So there are lots of. I don't mean that nobody has protections. We have lots and lots of protections. Um, uh, everybody at the New York Times, uh, uh, sorry, every full time worker at the New York Times, not me, uh, has is a member of a union and is protected from uh, from being fired by lots and lots of union uh, 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 union uh, contracts. So, but. Um, it, but a vast number of people in this country just can be fired willy-nilly. And that is a kind of insecurity that's like not knowing whether you own your house, whether you'll be able to have your house tomorrow, it seems to me. So that is as important as that. And so there's a, there's a liberty-related reason for thinking that we ought not to expose people to that kind of insecurity. You can't plan a decent life. You can't make the plans of life that that uh, Mill talks about in chapter three of our liberty, which I've already mentioned. Uh, you can't make those plans if you don't have those things. So it's very important. Now, as you say, and as I've been underlining, um, uh, private uh, corporations are not a very good way of making that happen any more than private corporations are a terrifically good way of guaranteeing security of property. Uh, um, so, so, we need, so this is a place where I think politics has to be involved. We have to have some kind of state uh, uh, discussion about how the state is going to handle this. And in the United States, it may be, I suspect this conversation will be easier in Canada. In the United States, this conversation is very hard even to begin because people take it that God ordained that you should have uh, employment at will. Um, and they seem to think that it's sort of a part of the natural condition of things that uh, in the relationship between the employer and the employee, the employer is able to dominate the employee. That just seems wrong to me. So that's a problem that uh, is, is discussed in Anderson's book that I mentioned at the start, and it's a very important problem. And I'm glad to say that because she's such a persuasive writer, uh, th there is actually discussion now, even in the policy realm, about what we ought to do to secure those interests that are currently not secured in the workforce. Great. Abby. Thank you. Um, so I kind of want maybe just to go back to your response to the first question. And as you mentioned, like in your lecture, um, Arendt and Keynes kind of suggest that we're, we would see this problem with like the insufficiency of work or the lack of work sooner than it seems we have. And I was wondering if you could speak about why we didn't see that in the way they anticipated. Like, does that like does our our failure to engage in this question reflect in some way that they like, gets played out differently than they expected in some ways? That's a terrific question. Uh, which is what you say when you're not quite sure what the answer is. Um, look, uh, well, one thing, uh, I think one thing that happened uh, in, in the country that uh, Keynes was speaking from, the United Kingdom, uh, was that in the period after he spoke, the trades union movement grew mightily in power. Um, and from the 19, well, basically after the, uh, the post-war Labour government, the 1945 Labour government, um, which I have a special feeling for since my grandfather was the, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer in that government, uh, um, uh, after then, uh, the, the, there were lots and lots and lots of, uh, protections, uh, uh, for workers. And so simply firing people because, uh, you know, uh, because you could replace them got to be expensive. And so it slowed down the rate at which that happened. It slowed down, I think, the rate at which, for example, um, mining was uh, industrialized. 
Now, or mechanized. Um, now, Mrs. Thatcher thought that was a terrible thing. And so she, uh, she destroyed uh, the miners' union and, and, uh, the, and the, the, much of the basis for uh, the power of the union movement more generally. Uh, uh, and um, I'm not going to debate the, the, the virtues uh, or vices of Thatcherism. Uh, but, um, but I think that part of the story is, is that. And notice that what's, what's, what, why is that? Well, it's because uh, under a, a regime, a labor regime in which unions have a lot of power, workers' interests are represented in a way in which they're not. In. Now, there are lots of, uh, I, again, there's corruption in unions as there is in all, all places where there's power accumulates and so on. So then there can be, and unions can be very, uh, can, can end up bullying people too. But, but they do uh, tend to be organized in ways that reflect workers' interests. And security of tenure is one of the things that, as I've just argued, uh, workers rightly care about. But, but I think the, um, the larger question is a question that, that who's the tools for which I don't have, which which is the it's a question in in um, about this problem that Ricardo Zago I mentioned talked to me about uh, the, the question of um, the relationship in uh, in the development of technology between uh, the ways in which technology uh, removes jobs and the ways in which it creates them and there's a puzzle about why so far it has tended to be the case. We understand in the particular cases that I talked about, the ATM and the and the industrialization of agriculture, we understand in those cases why it was that the new jobs were more numerous than the old ones. But um, but I don't know that we understand something that guarantees that new technologies uh, will will solve. Which is why you know I think we should be prepared for the possibility that they don't. There's another thing going on which I didn't talk about in the current economy, of course, which is. I, I did talk about it a bit, what I call the hollowing out of the, the middle class, uh, which is the, 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 the sort of uh, income distribution curve has gotten very weird. Uh, there's, a, the, the, there's, there's growth of income is going on at the top. The, num the proportion of the population sort of in the middle is declining and the proportion of people at the bottom is going up. Um, and... Um, there are people who claim to understand why that's happening. I'm not one of them. Alyssa. Hi, um, thank you so much for that uh, very insightful and inspiring talk. Um, I wanted to ask a question that was kind of more hitting on a very um, I guess in an in a emotional sense, uh, digging deeper into kind of the realities of, of the human condition in the time we're living in um, and the implications that might have on this question that we're you know discussing today. Like, um, so when we're talking about, you know, the post-work kind of, I should I even call it an economy, but post-work society in a sense, um, we're talking about, you know, the ways in which fulfillment and um, kind of human growth, uh, what it's going to look like and, and what that means for it. But I, I think I hesitate because I consider uh, particularly the, the very like hyper capitalist kind of period we're living in now. Um, there's kind of very visible effects on the way, I mean, psychologically, socially, um, in terms of the dynamics of how we act as individuals, our perceptions of our own humanity. Um, like just for example, I mean, you know, an Amazon Prime worker just sitting around like, I don't know, a bunch of like machines all day, just like uh, totally empty. Um, and that's just a very, you know, off the top of the head kind of visualization of the idea I'm trying to get at here, but, uh, you know, the amount of atomization that this economy has produced, the um, kind of platforms and the, you know, the ways that it's changed how we communicate, how we interact and how we just see ourselves as human beings. Um, I mean, we are being physically sure replaced by machines in the workplace, but uh, I wonder if all of this, uh, almost primes us to see us more as machines rather than being replaced by them. Uh, we, we might be, you know, 
uh, inheriting these habits or taking these habits on these behaviors that, you know, kind of show this, uh, I guess this mirroring almost. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you can all think of like ways that might look, you know, I'm sure everyone's pretty aware of what that means now. And especially like literally right now we're sitting like staring, talking to our laptops and everything. But um, so when we're addressing this question, are the forms and understandings of what gives meaning to our lives as human beings, are they one either capable of escaping kind of these pressures, these very real pressures? Um, and is there something just so kind of intrinsic that we're kind of talking about here? And is that something that is safe and, uh, you know, safe from all of these things? And if it has, you know, been subject to these pressures, which I, surely believe it has been. Um, how does that affect the way we're answering this question? Because, you know, what does human fulfillment look like to someone who feels uh, entirely uh, useless uh, because, you know, they envision themselves in terms of uh, productivity? And, uh, you know, that's, that's just a very simple way of putting it, but, you know, well, you get the idea. I do. Uh, um, the particular ways in which people come to value themselves are always connected with the kind of technologies that their society operates. So I, I mentioned the growing sense uh, in, in England uh, in the period, basically after the French Revolution, of... Um, proud pride in being a worker being a manufacturer someone who worked in a factory and made something and the tendency among and this 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 idea that this is this is the real kind of value right um doesn't just it starts then but still in the mid 20th century in the 1950s um when Michael Young interviewed uh, people in the East End of London, in the, the large, which was, as Engels observed, the largest working class uh, neighborhood in Europe uh, in the 19th century, and it was still a very big working class neighborhood in the, in the 20th century when Michael Young went there, um, they, <laughs> they were very disparaging of what they, you know, they said things like, well, managers are people who are paid for just walking around that they had a very strong sense that their role in production was the crucial and important role, that uh, miners were doing something important and crucial too, builders were doing something crucial and important, but, 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 and doctors were doing something important, but, but managers, the managerial class, they were not. So um, now that thought that the, um, that the, that the really, the real, heart of the society is working people, which is very powerful thought in, in, in these working men's associations in the 19th century. That thought is connected with a technological fact, which was that the British economy was increasingly centered on that kind of production. And it was just true that their society was hugely dependent upon them and that the progress it was making, the things that it was able to do that it hadn't been able to do before, including the things in the sciences and in the arts, were made possible on the basis of what they were doing. So, um, but, you know, uh, uh, if your society isn't one with that kind of industrial productivity at its heart, it's hard to think of the people who still do that. There are lots of people still doing that. It's hard for them to think of themselves as being, as it were, at the center of the, of the symbolic life of their society and of, of the things that matter. So it's, it's, um, now, I say all that because um, uh, what happens in the ways in which people think about these things will depend on what we decide to do in answer to the issues that I'm raising. It will depend on how we reshape the social world in response to these things. We can do it in ways that will produce more and more people uh, where, you know, you're sitting in a, in a, uh, in a space like that. Um, uh, let me go back to my last image, right? Uh, there's two people in that picture. Uh, 
uh, it used to be that a, that a, even in, with um, uh, you know uh, the, the system of mechanized Fordist manufacture and that lots of people were involved in making a car and that you could chat to them as you went about it. Those two guys are too far apart to have a conversation. Um, that's a choice that you to organize labor in those kinds of ways. So, um, so we have choices to make as well. And those choices will affect how it's um, sensible to respond to the world. And um, I give you, actually, I have an example of this uh, from my own experience, uh, which is for bizarre reasons, um, I ended up uh, being owner, co-owner of the last uh, entity with which Time Warner merged before it merged with AOL. Uh, because they bought a tiny website. <laughs> the last thing they did before they joined was they bought a tiny website that I had a tiny share in. I didn't, I didn't get rich, but I, for a brief moment, I had some Time Warner stock, which was then uh, turned into AOL Time Warner stock and uh, became worthless almost immediately. Um, now, but in that process, I saw what happened when people from an, an older technology, the Time Warner people, the people who made movies and television, interacted with the AOL people who, were, who thought of themselves as the new technology, the people who, who, who did smart stuff in this thing. And what was fascinating to me was that the programmers and the people on the programming side, the AOL people, had contempt for the business, for the business people from the other business. It was fascinating to watch. And one thing that I thought was, this isn't going to work because these people have contempt for one another. Uh, well, and it and it didn't, <laughs> so I should have I should have found a way of betting on that, but um, so uh, now, so now that AOL attitude, right? It's the it's the sort of Silicon Valley attitude. It's the attitude of the engineers and and people designers there who say we are making the big productive uh, advances in our society. You should listen to us. We know how to do this. And, um, and those jobs are uh, worth doing in part because they're intellectually challenging, many of them, but in part because they're in an industry which rightly thinks of itself as reshaping the world. And it's exciting to be an employee of an organization that's in the business of reshaping the world, especially if you think that it's reshaping the world for the better, um, which is what the people in the car industry thought they were doing. They were making better, cheaper, cars so that more people in the world can drive around and uh, Google and and so on are, are making more and better something in order to make something better I'm not entirely sure what but they are we have to decide whether we want to let our world be shaped um, entirely by you know their notions of what's good technology uh, not because uh, I don't mean that we should, uh, as it would be, banning their technology, but I think we, as consumers and as and as uh, thoughtful people, should be thinking about how we are allowing these technologies to shape our lives and whether we want them to do that. Th this is a bit off topic, but nothing could be more obvious, I think, than our uh, need to worry about the ways in which uh, social media technologies are. Uh, ev eviscerating our politics. Um, and it may be that there's a place for the state uh, in, in regulating some of that, but a lot of it is a matter of us thinking more seriously about how we want to, how we want to live uh, and how we want to do our politics and so on. And that's not just a matter for the state. Right. And so that's the kind of the individual question that I wonder about, because sometimes I wonder if, um, you know, we might collectively uh, be in a position to even uh, imagine these kinds of alternatives or, or these futures for ourselves as, as um, you know, as people. And yeah, it does remind me, actually, you talked a lot about Graeber, but yes, he has the, that quote of, you know, ultimately the truth of, uh, what is it? you know, the truth is basically that we, we made this world and we can undo it. And that's certainly like very important when we are talking about these kind of the, the dynamism of our economy and this kind of reorientation around, you know, the Silicon Valley kind of yeah. economy, the, the 
you know, the digital economy and so I, on. I'm afraid I'm going to interrupt before uh, you try to give a follow-up answer. We are nearly out of time. Um, I am going to roll dice to select a student who will have a choice between uh, a giveaway of the books, The Honor Code and The Lies That Bind. And the roll is, uh, is Omu Kulsum Abdul Rahman in the room. Raise your hand if you're still here. Okay. Uh, Omu, uh, uh, Nina Arendt, the coordinator of the center, will be in touch with you. Um, we have three more, uh, two more events in this series proper this semester, followed by the Lynn Center's annual lecture in this same format. Uh, after reading week, we will reconvene on March 11th for Michelle Schwartz's RGCS lecture. Uh, sympathetic resentment and injustice in liberal societies. Two weeks after that, we will have an RGCS debate featuring Chiara Cordelli from the University of Chicago and Rick Garnett from the University of Notre Dame uh, debating, must churches be democratic? And uh, the Lynn Center's annual lecture will be given on Thursday, April 8th in this same time slot by Bruno Latour and that lecture is uh, one of the very first events in McGill's year-long celebration of its bicentennial. And Professor Latour's Lynn Center lecture will be called From One Lockdown to the Next, mm -hmm. a Change in Cosmology. Um, the RGCS Student Fellows will reconvene with Professor Appia in about 15 minutes time. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank and you. please join me in thanking Anthony Appia. Thank you very much. It was uh, great questions, great questions. Thank you. And I'll see some of you in a minute. Yes. Okay, take care.